Okay, so um, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, <laughs> I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this very. Um, uh, sorry, maybe I should mute myself yeah. because I see. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, yes, but they. Ah, okay. The young. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, I would like to thank the speakers for uh, inviting me to this very interesting conference. Uh, so basically, uh, today I'm going to talk about the research activity I've been focused on in the last, uh, let's say, three years, and uh, which, broadly speaking, regards the uh, interplay between uh, data and uh, machine learning performances. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, as we all know, uh, the great success of deep learning can be mainly ascribed to two distinct factors. On one side, the design of uh, efficient learning algorithms and uh, architectures. On the other side, the increasingly higher amount of um, available data. However, up to this point, lots of efforts have been devoted in trying to understand the role played by both uh, architectures and algorithms, but very few has been done concerning data. And this actually started becoming uh, quite an odd topic within the machine learning uh, community. Uh, and indeed, quite recently, Andrew and G posted uh, this tweet where uh, it basically started wondering whether it wouldn't be the case to start pushing both researchers and companies to work on data while uh, keeping architectures and algorithms fixed, rather than keep on doing the opposite. Uh, why this? Well, because we all know that basically data are the core of machine learning problems because they are used to fit billions of parameters to implement trial and error strategies for um, hyperparameters, uh, fine-tuning, and so on and so forth. However, if you look uh, at the earliest statistical physics works of the late 80s, like uh, the pioneer work by Gardner and Derrida, uh, you will basically realize that uh, despite all these works managed to capture several aspects of learning, um, they actually completely ignore the role played by, by data. So data are simply assumed to be uh, unstructured and sample identically and independently from uh, a Gaussian distribution. However, we know that basically in uh, real machine learning applications, uh, um, data are simply structured. And uh, it is precisely this structure that a machine learning model tries to grasp somehow to learn how to generalize well on previously unseen data. Now, the good news is that uh, quite recently, there has been a huge activity within the statistical physics uh, community, which basically tried to extend the previous statistical physics works, and in particular, uh, replica theory. Uh, up to the point, we uh, basically now manage to deal with data that uh, either are sampled from a single Gaussian or a Gaussian mixture, but with non-trivial means and, uh, and covariances. So including data structure into the game and extending statistical physics to take care of uh, uh, data structure has basically allowed us to start exploring uh, several machine learning uh, frameworks. And uh, here in these slides, I'm going to list uh, some of them on which we are currently active. For instance, we are trying to understand uh, the, the gap in generalization performances between random features and uh, neural network models when all the information uh, to accomplish a given task uh, is precisely encoded in the higher order statistics of the input data distribution. And uh, if you're interested about it, Esther and Lorenzo has two posters on the, on the topic. Then uh, we also recently uh, started getting interested in uh, self-supervised learning that now basically after this conference we, we know that is the dominated paradigm with which uh, large language models are currently trained uh, on. And um, like for instance the transformers and uh, Ricardo has uh, a poster uh, about it if you are interested. 
Then we also start approaching the thorny issue of fairness in uh, machine learning problems. <coughs> but in today's talk, uh, I'm, uh, I will be basically focused uh, on uh, uh, some advance that we have done with statistical physics theory on uh, uh, basically transfer learning. So why did we got so interested uh, in uh, transfer learning uh, scenarios? Well, simply because, I mean, we all know that deep learning is intrinsically data hungry in the sense that uh, it requires a lot of uh, data to generalize well on uh, previously unseen examples. However, if you think about it, there are some contexts in which basically collecting huge amounts of uh, labeled data uh, is simply impracticable. Uh, for instance, uh, in healthcare, one should think to set up a pool of medical experts which can label each single frame of each single patient to medical examination. And this, of course, has a huge cost in terms of both uh, time and uh, money. Okay, so a possible solution which can uh, somehow mitigate the need of uh, new labeled data is precisely transfer learning. And this is a deep learning technique which is based on the idea that the generalization performances of uh, a neural network that has to be trained on a data scarce target task can be basically consistently improved by exploiting the knowledge that a second network has previously acquired on a related but uh, data abundant uh, source task. So the typical transfer learning pipeline uh, then occurs in the following way. You first have a network A that is trained uh, on a data abundant uh, source task. Then all those layers which are responsible for feature extractions are then transferred to a second network, the network B, that is then trained on the target set while keeping the um, transfer feature map frozen and letting just the very last layer to adapt to the target set, okay? Eventually, deep learning prediction has further had the stage of fine tuning, where they basically uh, unlock the transfer feature map and then retrain the whole network uh, on the target set, okay? Are there any questions up to this point? Okay, I hope it was clear, okay. so. Despite transfer learning is widely used uh, in uh, deep learning applications uh, up to the point that we all know that nowadays no, nobody basically trains deep learning models completely from scratch, um, this technique is still poorly understood from uh, a theoretical point of view. And there are indeed several questions that stay open. For instance, uh, how the source and the target task needs to be related uh, in such a way to improve transfer learning performances or is the fine tuning stage um, always beneficial or there are some conditions where it can lead to uh, overfitting. So we believe that a key ingredient to answer this question is a good model for data which can somehow capture the non-trivial correlations between the source and the uh, target set. So um, what we did was basically to propose the correlated the hidden manifold model as a model for structured and uh, correlated uh, data sets, where the correlations basically appear explicitly and are directly tunable. This basically allowed us to uh, explore several transfer learning settings uh, and uh, it allows us to delineate basically the, the boundaries of transfer learning uh, effectiveness. Now, as the name itself uh, suggests, the, the building block of the correlated uh, hidden manifold model is the hidden manifold model itself. Uh, you have learned from Francesco's talk something about this model, but this is a model for structured data that has been proposed by Sebastian Gold and uh, collaborators in 2019. And uh, it is basically based on the evidence that real world data sets do not span uniformly the entire input space, but they are rather confined uh, on a lower dimensional manifold. So according to this model, each input X is constructed as a nonlinear combination of some generative features F with some non-Gaussian coefficient uh, C. 
okay? So the, the C could be interpreted as the lower dimensional representation of the input X in the lower dimensional manifold. So this model goes precisely along the line model generative models that starting from, uh, uh, let's say, a Latin variable then starts basically um, producing a high dimensional uh, uh, inputs, okay? Then what about the labels? The labels are provided by a teacher vector instead that directly acts on the Latin space, yes. Yeah, so it's like or on the no, it's applied uh, component-wise. Here, I just wrote it in uh, the metric notation, but I should have put it uh, on a point. Then um, uh, here, sigma is some nonlinearity, whatever you want, relu, 10h, whatever nonlinearity you want, and then L is instead the intrinsic dimension, which is nothing but the dimension of the lower dimensional uh, manifold. Okay, so there is a salient trait in this model that is that it directly provides access to the generative features, to the teacher vector, and to the intrinsic dimension of the synthetic data model. And we actually exploit this feature of the hidden manifold model in the correlated hidden manifold model. And in particular, we construct the source task as a standard hidden manifold model while the target task is constructed from the source task by basically directly uh, manipulating either the generative features or the teacher vector or the intrinsic dimension. And in particular, what we did was to consider three different types of uh, manipulation, feature perturbation and substitution, addition or deletion, and teacher perturbation. Now, keep in mind that basically all these manipulations are meant to mimic some situations which can concretely occur in real-world data experiments, okay? For instance, the teacher perturbation would correspond to the case where two datasets are sharing a common set of inputs, but they are labeled according to a different labeling rule. And this is basically controlled in our model by this parameter Q, which defines the, teacher, the, the source target teacher overlap. Okay, are there any questions up to this point? Okay, perfect. So, um, given this model for data, we then consider the following transfer learning setting. So, first of all, uh, we take a two-layer neural network that we train on the source task completely from scratch, okay? Then we take the first layer weight of the, of the first uh, two-layer network, and we basically transfer to a second two-layer network, which we train on the target set while keeping the first layer weight frozen and just retraining the second layer on the target set, okay? So we call this model transfer feature. Now, given this model, uh, the goal is the usual one, so achieve the lowest possible generalization error by empirical risk minimization. Here we tried with the logistic loss plus some L2 uh, regularized. Um, and um, actually, at this point, we uh, basically have um, a good news and a bad news. <laughs> so the, <laughs> the good news is that this model uh, the correlated uh, hidden manifold model basically belongs to a family of Gaussian model that we know how to treat analytically by means of statistical uh, physics tools. And by analytical treatment, uh, I mean that we manage to compute the generalization error, the training loss, and all the other uh, observable of uh, interest in a given machine learning uh, problem, okay? But the bad news <laughs> is that the model is still a Gaussian model. So in principle, there is no guarantee that this model can actually correctly describe situations that you can concretely, I mean, encounter while working with real world datasets, okay? However, there is a good news in the bad news. <laughs> that is that um, basically um, there exist uh, some Gaussian un universalities in some machine learning uh, uh, context, uh, where basically uh, the machine learning model is completely insensible to the fine details of the input data distribution, 
What he just care are the first, uh, let's say, uh, moments of the uh, of the input data distribution itself. And this is, for instance, the case uh, I'm showing uh, here on this slide, which is precisely the case of uh, a single layer neural network that is trained with random labels uh, on uh, a given classification task. Okay, so basically, um, you can image, uh, for instance, to take your favorite real data set, okay? For instance, MNIST, Fashion MNIST, Cypher 10, whatever, let's say, data set you want. And then you basically train your single layer network with random labels in a given classification uh, task. And you measure the training loss as a function of the size of your training set, okay? If you do that, uh, you will be uh, basically obtain uh, all these colored points uh, that I'm plotting here in this matrix of plots, okay? But actually, the interesting thing, thing to uh, notice uh, is that the solid black line instead corresponds to the outcome of the statistical physics analysis, so the theoretical prediction of uh, statistical um, physics that are basically obtained by approximating the true data set distribution with uh, a Gaussian uh, uh, measure whose mean and covariance matrices do precisely coincide with the empirical mean and the empirical covariance matrix of the true data set uh, distribution, okay? So if you look at it, you observe uh, precisely, I mean, a striking qualitative match that basically is suggesting you that these learning models, for instance, is just taking care about the covariance of the input data distribution. It doesn't look at anything else, okay? Is that clear up to this point, or are there any questions? Okay, perfect. So it turns out, actually, that uh, uh, if you go into the zero regularization limit, there are even stronger Gaussian universalities up to the point that all the learning curves corresponding to all the different uh, real data set uh, distribution collapse precisely into the same learning curve, which is the one of uh, unstructured data. So there are even uh, further and, and stronger Gaussian universality. Now, this was just uh, an example, but actually I did it because even in transfer learning, you can observe some Gaussian universalities, even if a bit weaker than the one that I'm showing uh, on, uh, on this slide. And uh, to, to see that, we could basically design uh, the following experiment. So we can construct the source task um, by selecting a subset of the MNIST letters, and then basically group all the examples in this subset into two distinct groups, and you basically assign to each one of these group a label according to the group membership, okay? This is the source task. Then to construct the target task, what we do is that we remove, we substitute a letter per group, okay? In this way, some relevant traits that were previously present in the source task, some relevant traits of the inputs, do no longer appear in the target set, okay? So given this, uh, I mean, this set of uh, uh, real uh, data sets, so what, we do, what we did was then to measure the generalization error as a function of the size of the target set of the transfer feature model, okay? If you do that, you will get precisely this light blue curve that I'm showing uh, here on, uh, on this plot. And we basically compare the generalization performances of this model with uh, a two-layer network trained completely from scratch, which is the, uh, let's say, green curve uh, in the plot, uh, a random feature model, which is the orange curve, and then a transfer feature model plus fine-tuning. Now, if you look at this plot, you can basically observe um, uh, many interesting things. For instance, fine-tuning uh, seems to be not so beneficial uh, in uh, the data scarce regime. There are some peaks that appear here and uh, which are directly related to the double descent phenomenon. And uh, if you see, I mean, in the transfer feature model, the peak is delayed, and this is simply a consequence of the correlations 
that have been uh, uh, encoded in already in the transfer feature map, okay? But what we were basically uh, interested in this, at this point was basically to check whether the correlated the hidden manifold model can capture somehow um, the picture that emerged with, uh, I mean, real dataset experiments, okay? So uh, to do that, we take the source task as a hidden manifold model, and the target task uh, was constructed from the source task by substituting the 30% of, um, of the feature, okay? If you then repeat precisely the same experiment that we did in the case of the real data, what you get uh, is a picture like this. So there is a striking qualitative behavior between the numerical experiments with real data sets and what can instead be observed with the, with the synthetic one. And I just would like to stress that the solid uh, lines on, uh, on these slides do precisely correspond to the replica prediction, so the statistical physics uh, computation. Okay. So, motivated by this striking qualitative agreement and by the fact that in the correlated hidden manifold model, the correlations appear explicitly and are directly tunable, you can imagine, uh, as a theoretical physicist, we start drawing all the possible phase diagrams by tuning all the possible parameters to see many different <laughs> scenarios. You can find all, the, all these phase diagrams in the paper if you um, are interested in, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but actually, for the purpose of this talk, yes, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, because it shifted to the right. So you see here, it occurs here. Wait for the transfer feature model, it occurs ah, slightly so later. The yeah. To the yeah, to the random feature. Ah, no, no, sorry. No, it was delayed. Uh, no, don't worry. It was delayed uh, um, between the two models. You mean the teacher, uh, um, the source target uh, teacher perturbation? Yes. Uh, no, okay. Uh, the phase diagram are obtained uh, with the correlated the hidden manifold model simply because we run some experiments like this. Here I'm just showing you an, a single experiment of uh, real data, of course, for time constraint. And uh, actually what we saw by running all these numerical experiments is that there was a, a, a striking match by just tuning these parameters of the correlated the hidden manifold model. So at that point we simply trusted that <laughs> it was correctly reproducing the thing. And uh, so we generate the phase diagrams uh, with, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the correlated uh, hidden manifold model. Also because if once you have the replica computations to compute all this stuff, uh, uh, it's basically much, uh, I mean, it's basically faster than uh, running simulations. So you can get phase diagrams quite easily without waiting for, yeah. Okay. So uh, for the purpose of this talk, uh, I would like to basically show you the phase diagram which are basically related to understand the effect of the source target relatedness in uh, transfer learning problems, okay? So what are you observing in these slides are three different phase diagrams which compare the transfer feature model with the two layer network, the random features and the transfer feature plus fine tuning. The blue region corresponds to the case where the transfer feature performs better than the random features. And on the y-axis, we have the size of the target training set, while on the x-axis, we precisely have a measure of relatedness between the two tasks, which, as I was telling you, is this overlap in the teacher perturbation, for instance. Okay, 
So you can notice many interesting things. For instance, for fine tuning is overfitting in the data scarce regime. Transfer feature is always uh, performing better uh, than all the other models when you do not have enough data. And uh, uh, the two tasks uh, are, um, I mean, consistently correlated. But uh, for the purpose of this talk, I would like you to concentrate on this red spot on the right corner of, uh, no, the left corner, sorry, <laughs> of, the, of the phase diagram. And this is precisely an example of negative transfer. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, it means simply that in this regime, the source and the target data set are so purely correlated that basically uh, transferring uh, the, the features from the source task uh, is not beneficial because those features has nothing to do uh, with what you would have learned on the target set with enough data. <coughs> so basically it is even better to keep them fixed to random rather than to transfer something, okay? So given this statistical uh, physics analysis, what we would have liked to, to do was basically to try to understand which are instead the implication in a deep learning setting, okay? So to, to do that, we basically considered the, the, the following deep learning uh, setup. Okay, concerning the data sets, uh, we use three different clones of the Cypher 10 uh, datasets, which are constructed in the following way. So in the first clone, which is called uh, ISO-GM, we simply sample uh, images according to a Gaussian mixture, whose mean precisely coincide uh, with the empirical mean uh, uh, of the true Cypher 10 distribution, okay? Then, the, the second clone is instead constructed by sampling images from, again, a Gaussian mixture, but this time with the first and second moment matching. So not only the, the, the means are matching with the true data distribution, but also the, the covariances. So basically, these clones are meant to form a hierarchical family of approximation of the true Cypher 10 distribution that uh, increase, uh, I mean, um, in uh, resolution, let's say. And these two benchmark data sets have been proposed by uh, Maria Refinetti, Alessandro Ingrosso, and Sebastian Gold uh, quite, uh, quite recently. Then, to go beyond the, the second moment, we instead propose to uh, basically construct uh, um, a third type of clone by playing with the bottleneck size of a depot encoder. So the larger is the bottleneck size, uh, the, let's say, more accurate would be the reconstruction of the original data set. Then for architectures and uh, algorithms, nothing to say because we basically use uh, uh, standard uh, protocols in uh, computer vision uh, deep learning. Okay, are there any questions? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's simply a, a depot encoder. So the, let's say the function with which you are basically generating the data is the network itself. So you start. Uh, that you start from uh, an original image, then you train uh, your depot encoder because these are models that are trained to generate new, new type of images. And what you do is that you basically, at the end, get the, the reconstructed uh, image. Where do you train uh, In the network, no? I, don't, I think I don't get the point. Like how you get an input from this model? How you get an input? Uh, because these models are are meant for that. So you basically have a neural network that first have uh, an encoder stage where basically encode all the information that is relevant in the input. Then as a, a decoder stage where basically... Yeah. Yeah. No, no, this is, no, this I mean, if you, if you play with the size of the bottleneck, you will get the reconstruction that you, that you have. 
Yes, I don't see the point, sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, no, the bottleneck is fixed, and then you, you just play with the sides of it. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. No, 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 it's just that you corrupt, corrupt it to, to get a new, a new clone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's fixed, yeah. But then you get just noisy samples of the data set all over, so you don't get a new image. No, no, you just uh, try to, um, I mean, to, to get, let's say, to, to play a little bit with, uh, I mean, the size of the bottleneck to construct a different type of uh, images. It's always meant to be an approximation of the original yeah, thing that yeah, you did. Exactly. You're not going to find the new face. No, 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 no. <laughs> This is just to, ah, okay, perfect, now I got it, sorry. <laughs> no, it's just to, to, to corrupt a little bit your image in such a way that you basically have an increasingly higher approximation of the true underlying distribution. So you can, uh, also construct the whole thing with a new set of sentences. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay. So uh, given, let's say, these three types of uh, clones, uh, we wanted to understand the, the effect of the source target correlations in a deep learning context. So, what, uh, to do that, we first consider a transfer learning scenario where uh, the source task is the deep out encoder clone, while the target task is precisely Cypher 10. And what I'm plotting here is what we have called in the paper the defrosting profile. So, the first point in this curve. So this point here corresponds precisely to the case where you basically train uh, the neural network completely from scratch on the target set. The last point corresponds instead to the case where you keep the entire network frozen and you just retrain the readout layer on the target set. So frozen to the features that have been learned on the deep out encoder. Then in the I mean, in the middle, you can find these intermediate points that would correspond to intermediate uh, situations where basically, for instance, in this point, you keep frozen all the layers up to the tent, and then you just retrain the remaining layer on the target set, okay? So if you look at this plot, nothing special happens because this is precisely what deep learning practitioners often does, that is basically to transfer all the feature extractor layers, and then you get with this transfer learning strategy, the optimal performances. However, this is convenient to do only if the datasets uh, are kind of good correlated between each other, because if instead they just share the first moment of the input data distribution, you start precisely observing the negative transfer effects that I was mentioning before. So in this case, if the source task is ISO-GM, it is basically never convenient to transfer, okay? However, what it is interesting to notice is that there are some intermediate situations in which the optimal transfer depth is some non-trivial number. So it is neither convenient to train completely from scratch nor to basically keep the entire network frozen. And uh, therefore, I mean, transferring up to the very last layer, I mean, all the feature extractor layers uh, does not seem to be the, the optimal uh, learning uh, transfer learning strategy. And by the way, we observe these sort of scenarios, uh, uh, I apologize for the <laughs> bad images of the retina disease, but um, <laughs> if, you <laughs> uh, if you do that in a standard, uh, let's say, transfer learning settings where you, your source task is ImageNet and the target set is some medical uh, data set, you actually observe uh, some, uh, let's say, closer phenomenon. So, Given the robustness uh, of this phenomenon, um, for us it would have been, let's say, very important to, first of all, identify uh, the, the optimal transfer depth independently on the source and the target. So basically have an algorithm that can do actually this, can identify the, 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 the optimal number of layers to transfer. And then a possibly a strategy to identify the optimal source task among all the candidates one. 
because if you if you do that then of course this is extremely important because you will start from a, a better initial condition that is important for later fine tuning strategies okay so Concerning the, the algorithm, uh, we have a very preliminary proposal that is extremely simple. So you basically start from the condition where the entire network is frozen, and you just let the very last layer to be retrained on the, uh, on the target set. Then with, uh, I mean, subsequent cycles, so you keep on unfrozing uh, all the layers, no? Up to the point you arrive to the condition that the entire network is trained uh, from scratch on the, on the target set. Now, if you do this operation, you will get the defrosting profile uh, I was mentioning you for a given uh, pair of source uh, target uh, task. Um, however, the, the good thing is that uh, in all the experiments that we did, these defrosting profiles appears to be quite regular. So you could basically have an algorithm that samples just a few points on this profile and then infer the position of the maximum directly from, uh, from it. Instead, concerning uh, how to select uh, the, the source task uh, uh, among all the available candidates, <coughs> what we did was to use this measure, information imbalance, that uh, have been uh, developed uh, quite recently in uh, Alessandro Laios group. And to compute this measure and to select the, the source task, what we did was the following. First, we took two layer network, uh, two neural networks, okay? The first one pre-trained on the source task, so it's one that you could easily download from uh, Py the PyTorch Zoo, for instance. And the second one is a neural network trained completely from scratch on the target set. Given these two networks, we make flow through both networks the test set of the target task, okay? And we extract the internal representation of, uh, I mean, both layers, uh, of both networks for each one of the layers. At this point, which are basically this H here. Now, at this point, we have all the ingredients to compute the information uh, uh, imbalance. And to do that, we first go into the space of the source internal representation, okay? We then rank all uh, the internal representation of each test uh, uh, data set uh, point according to Euclidean distance measures, okay? And then for each point in the test set, we go and check which is the first uh, uh, nearest neighbor, okay? Then once we have identified it, we go into the space of the internal representations of the target set, and we check whether the first nearest neighbor in the source task is also first nearest neighbor in the target task, okay? If this is the case, then it <coughs> means that the local neighborhood of the source and the target space are similar, okay? And information imbalance is a quantity that is precisely measuring this similarity uh, among, uh, uh, let's say, um, neighborhood of uh, internal neural network representation spaces. Okay? You can then repeat precisely uh, this, um, let's say, uh, procedure for all the layers. And if you do that, you would get uh, a plot like this, where I'm basically plotting the information imbalance as a function of the convolutional layer at which it has been computed. And um, in particular, I'm considering uh, three uh, different uh, curves. Uh, the, the pink one corresponds to the case where the source task is ISO-GM, the blue one uh, when it is GM, and the green one is the clone that comes from uh, the, the deep autoencoder, okay? So, um, the, um, and the target uh, task is always the cipher 10. So you, what you can notice is that basically the information imbalance is actually able to, to capture the fact that the deep autoencoder clone is the most promising uh, uh, task from which it is more convenient to transfer if you want to uh, train on, uh, on cipher 10. Because the smaller is in the information imbalance, uh, the more similar will be the two neighborhood uh, uh, space. Okay, and um, another side result uh, is that, uh, I mean, it is basically um, 
uh, further corroborating the idea that the first layers learn uh, the first order statistics while the deep layer in the networks are basically learning uh, some uh, higher order uh, information in the, in the moments of the input data distribution. Okay, so with this basically I conclude and uh, I would like to give you some take home messages. First of all, Supervised learning is not always feasible because not all data sets are actually easy to label. Then it is true that transfer learning is a possible solution to uh, data scarcity, but it needs to be used wisely because it strongly depends on how much the source and the target set uh, are correlated. So we do not, uh, in principle, have to use it blindly. Then once you have a model of synthetic data that uh, is actually able to reproduce what you observe on uh, real data sets, this is actually a good thing because you can explore several transfer learning, uh, uh, I mean machine learning uh, scenario. And then the fourth thing that is more technical uh, is the fact that, um, I mean, the replica uh, calculation seems to suggest the existence of some universality class because just by tuning very few parameters, you are actually able to reproduce the, the experiments that you see on, uh, on real data sets. And so with this, uh, basically I conclude and I would like to thank uh, all these amazing people with, uh, which I had the pleasure to, to work with. And in particular, uh, Ludovic, uh, Esther, Lorenzo, and of course, Sebastian uh, are in the room. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to share this curve with different when the eyes is limited by the fact that they're using the uh, a neural network, neural network, right? Uh, given that you have this data set, that yeah. there is a limit to the statistics and that you can compute after the first layer just because there is a uh, yeah, about, uh, well, about the statistics, uh, I mean the statistic of the input data distribution, uh, not of the internal mm -hmm. representation. So because, uh, I mean, ICGM is constructed from Cypher 10 when you share just the first uh, moment yeah, yeah. of the but input data distribution. For a transformer, you mean? Oh. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay, in that sense, uh, okay, yes, but uh, these are not the, um, let's say, the correlations I was talking about in the sense that uh, I was really referring just to the input data distribution, so I'm not looking at the distribution of the internal representation. Then once you have the signal at <coughs> input, it propagates across to the network, and then yes, it depends what you, what you are saying, but the, um, let's say, the input data distribution uh, it is what I'm referring to when I say first, second, and the higher order moments. Well, I get my guess is that if you take a transformer, then you maybe you could uh, observe something similar. But the thing is that um, I mean I don't know how much this is instead related to the fact that this network uh, compressed the signal because, for instance, in the transformer, this is not the case. And so, uh, I don't know, we should uh, definitely check this out. But for the moment, this work was restricted to computer vision tasks, so that's why we took state of the art. Uh, but we could use also visual transformer, and this is something that uh, we are planning to do as a next step. But this was just uh, a first step to see whether we managed to see some signal. Hmm. Yes. Ah, yes. Yeah, allora, uh, okay, so the, um, uh, let's say the, okay, let me go back, okay. You mean uh, yeah. to get these curves? Okay, no, in that case, uh, it's the, the standard limit in the replica calculation. So you send the input dimension to infinity, the number of samples to infinity, and then you keep the ratio finite. We, it's the, the usual one. Yes, also. 
Yes. In this case, yes, because we basically do these replica calculations with, for instance, random features model that has been then extended to the case where you also do not have simply random features, but also features that have been trained uh, on uh, a given task. And what you do is that basically you can, if the, all these layers are fixed, you can run uh, the, the replica cal calculation uh, as if you would have had just a, a single layer network, which is the readout. And then basically uh, you, you have your input data, which are nothing but the, the activation function of the very last layer. And so then you apply the, the standard limit that is to, to send the input dimension to infinity, which is in this case is the hidden uh, uh, dimension, and then uh, um, the size of the training set, but the ratio needs to be kept finite. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but actually the input dimension, the hidden dimension, and the number of samples, they are all going to infinity with the same yeah, ratio. That's the, that's, the tri that, that's the thing. Because instead, if you, if you take the input dimension finite and then send, uh, let's say, the hidden to infinity, yes, you are right. It's precisely what you're doing. This is a non-trivial limit because they are scaling precisely in the same way. Okay. You're welcome. Yes. For the plots that you have with GM, IGGM. Yes, the, the, the final one. Yeah. So I'm wondering if how much does the model matter and how much is this just an effect of the fact that the default encoder is just a smaller L2 block that is stuck? No, I if you plot just the L2, would you obtain something similar? No, if, if you change the size of the bottleneck, uh, of course, you would uh, observe no, 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 something. Sure, but I'm wondering, so say you compute the L2 distance between the I's and GM and the input, yeah. and the L2 distance between the GM and the input, and the L2 yeah. distance, do you observe similar things? Yeah. Do you tune the autoencoder so that yeah. the L2 matches? Let's say, the, say I, I take the autoencoder so that the L2 matches GM. Yes. Would I observe that the green curve is pushed up uh, and it's close to the blue, or? Uh, yeah, I think that you would observe something more similar in the sense that uh, if the two data sets are closer, then, uh, and actually. I wonder what's the right notion of, of distance in this case. So it's L2 or spectral or? Yeah, you could, you could also do L2. I mean, we didn't compute the distance uh, uh, between, the, between the images because we were just interested, uh, I mean, sure, the input data distribution. And, and this is a sort of distance measure between internal network uh, representation. That is what we were interested in because we, what we believe is that may, maybe pushing with this sort of measure, we could uh, somehow implement an automatic algorithm that detects the optimal transfer depth by looking at the internal representation similarities. Uh, but it's yes, right yeah, yeah. If you, if you basically do that, uh, it, as you were saying, uh, I, I, I suppose it would be something like uh, um, similar, I mean, but reverse because the, it is that if they are closer, then uh, you, you get an higher agreement. And yeah, there is a hierarchy in these data sets that is reproduced. But let's say this experiment was more a proof of concept to, to see whether uh, it could work than with real uh, world applications. Mm.